But if this is the way we turn out in these strong Republican senators, what's happening to Mr. Nixon all over the United States? This is an important campaign. And these are important issues which face our country. And I appreciate your coming here. Prince Bismarck once said that one third of the students, I guess you better maybe get down there a little bit. The only time in this campaign the photographers did anything we asked them to do. <laughs> Prince Bismarck once said that one third of the students of German universities broke down from overwork, another third broke down from dissipation, and the other third ruled Germany. I do not know which third of the student body of this university is here today, but I'm confident I'm talking to the rulers of America in the sense in the sense that all educated men and women have the obligation to accept the discipline of self-government. Mr. Nixon and I campaigned for the most important office in the free world. But in my judgment, this is more than a contest between Mr. Nixon and myself. It is more than a contest between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. It is a contest between the contented and the concerned between those who wish to stand still and those, and those who, wish who wish to move ahead. ahead. Mr. Nixon runs on a slogan, we've never had it so good. I run on the slogan, we're going to have to do much better. Right. A good deal of unfavorable, a good deal of comparison, and most of it unfavorable, is drawn between the Lincoln-Douglas debates and Mr. Nixon's and I weekly brief appearance on What's Our Line every Friday night. I'm not sure, however, that we realize how different, how numerous, how sophisticated are the problems which face us as Americans compared to the single significant crucial problem that faced Mr. Lincoln and Mr. Douglas a century ago. Now the next President of the United States and the Senate and the House deal with monetary and fiscal problems that dwarf in significance those that they dealt with a century ago. We deal with the problem of outer space, the problem of how a free society can successfully maintain itself over a long period of time in competition with a totalitarian society which is able to mobilize all of its resources, both human and material, for the service of the state. I cannot possibly predict what the great issues will be, the new great issues, in the next four or five years. Any more than in 1940, when Wendell Wilkie and Franklin Roosevelt ran against each other, anyone could predict that in 1941 and two, Franklin Roosevelt would be asked by Albert Einstein and others to support a tremendous expenditure of money in order to break the atom. We cannot predict what new problems will come across our desks in the next four years. We could not have predicted in 1952, when President Eisenhower and Mr. Stevenson debated, that one of the great issues would be our recognitions of the significance of space. Where Franklin Roosevelt broke the atom, this administration failed to recognize the changing nature of our times, and we now see the Soviet pennant on the moon. And what is true of outer space, is true in every area of national and international government. The, in 19... I will itemize that charge. One month ago, Mr. Nixon said that if we had considered a program of aid to Latin America in 1955, we might not have had a Castro. And why didn't we? Why did the United States today spend one-tenth as much on information programs and radio programs to Latin America as the Soviet Union, one-tenth as much. We are the 14th country in the world in radio programs to Africa today. We brought more students from around the world 10 years ago to study here under federal auspices than we do today. We had more students offered to the Congo in the month of June for scholarships as a result of the explosion there than we offered to all of Africa the year before. Do you know last year we had more students from Thailand studying here than in the Africa south of the desert? All those new countries 
more students from one country in Asia than we did from all of Africa? Do you know how many students came from the Africa last year, all those countries, 155? We had more people stationed in Western Germany in the embassy in 1957 than in all of Africa. I make the point because Africa is new, revolutionary, contains one-fourth of all the members of the General Assembly, and this administration has not known that Africa has existed until the Congo blew up in our face. Do you know the next countries that are going to try to be independent and will be? The Portuguese colonies. Do you know how many students are studying from the Portuguese colonies in the United States to prepare for leadership? None. Guinea asked us for 500 teachers last year. You know how many teachers we sent them? One. <laughs> Guinea got its independence from France two years ago. It took us two months to recognize that independence. It took us eight months to send an ambassador. The ambassador from the Soviet Union arrived there the day Guinea was independent. There are six countries in Africa which are members of the United Nations which do not have a single American diplomat in residence in them. We spent less than 5% of our development loan fund meant for underdeveloped countries last year in Africa. I could go on and itemize it. And the result is that on the admission of Red China, not one of the 16 new African countries voted with us. More countries in Asia voted against us than voted with us. I run for the presidency in the most serious time in the life of our country, and these issues involve the security of everybody here. In the next 10 years, this globe around us is going to move in the direction of freedom or going to move in the direction of slavery. The Somunist system is militant, hopeful, confident, optimistic, and it has been able to identify itself all too successfully with a desire of these people in the underdeveloped world to live a better life. We have not done so. Cuba is only a phase of a great struggle which will take place in the next decade. We talk about Mr. Castro. The great issue is, what is the rest of Latin America going to do? Mexico, Panama, Bolivia? Why should the president of Brazil, in his campaign, feel it necessary to make a trip, not to Washington, but to Havana, in order to get Mr. Castro's blessings to be elected president of Brazil? Anyone who sits in this university and looks at the far reaches of the world, looks at the kind of competition which we are now undergoing, recognizes that every phase of our national and international life is being tested. Our economic growth, the development of our resources, the science and technology and energy of our society. Ten years ago, we produced twice as many scientists and engineers as the Russians. Today, one half. We, our last nine months, the United States had the lowest rate of economic growth almost in its history and the lowest of any major industrialized society in the world. Now, the question you have to decide is, is this good enough? Is this administration demonstrated its awareness of the world around us? Has it brought men and women? Has it brought men and women to Washington and sent them around the world who recognize our changing times? Or have they sent ambassadors who couldn't speak the language or even pronounce the name of the head of state to which they were accredited? We have filled the Department of Defense with personnel who have averaged less than 18 months in office in this most technical form. I don't think that what was good enough in the administrations of Harding and Coolidge and McKinley is good enough for today. We are being tested as we've never been tested before. And if we fail, we fail not only ourselves, but we fail the cause of freedom. And I come to this university, which is a center of knowledge, which is a center of truth. And you cannot possibly tell me in 1960 that the American people are going to choose to sit still and give power and responsibility to those who in the last eight years have demonstrated an unawareness of the basic nature of our times. The kind of society we build here, the kind of country we develop here, that is the test of our ability to lead around the world. What we are speaks far louder than what we say. I come here today and ask you to join in rebuilding the strength and image of the United States as a progressive society. I want the people of the world to wake up in the morning and wonder what the United States is doing, not what Mr. Khrushchev is doing. <laughs>